Okay. All right. Good morning, Uli. Good morning, everyone who is in this live broadcast right now. Uh, this is a own linguistics program we have at the University of, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And today we are honored to have here Professor Uli Sauerland. Uli doesn't really need much of an introduction. He's been to Brazil several times. He was actually about to come to, to Brazil right before the pandemic um, start, but he will be back here. We, he is in our uh, UFRJ uh, Capes Print program. But Uli has been around. He has taught at many universities, including Harvard University, Stanford University, University of Vienna, Osaka University, and uh, he is the director in the, <coughs> of the European Research Council project called Realizing Leibniz's Dream, Child Languages as a Mirror of the Mind. So, Uli, uh, without further ado, let me give the word to Uli. It's a very big pleasure for us to have you here this morning to talk about this very interesting mm -hmm. model in which semantics is at the center with the thought, Leibniz dream, right? So we're going to talk as about actually about Leibniz dream. Thank you, Uli. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcus, and um, uh, for the introduction and for this opportunity to sort of make up for the um, lost chance to interact last year. Um, and I came all the way to Rio, but then had to turn around because I, like the pandemic was catching up. Um, the, talk has progressed a little bit since then. Um, so uh, what I'm presenting is kind of the, this, the basic outline of this project. Um, you can switch now to the slide presentation, I think, because um, oop, oop. Ah, I'm I, sorry, I'm a bit confused because uh, my slides are ahead of the uh, YouTube presentation. Um, so I'm sort of going back to something that drove me first uh, to be interested in linguistics. I was an undergraduate student in mathematics and taking many classes in logic. And what, what interested me there is that kind of um, um, mathematicians all agree on what is a correct proof, not regardless of what their native language is. And so the seems to be some kind of um, universal uh, system of human thought that mathematics is tapping into and um, and language and but but it's always based on language mathematic um, communication always starts with ordinary language um, and this suggested to, to me sort of at the time that well looking at language in more detail uh, would also be a way of finding out more about this uh, general human thought system and so that's why I decided to then enter the PhD program in linguistics and um, yeah I'm still working on my on my initial uh, ambition in that field. Um, so, um, and um, one of the, um, so, and, 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 and like the um, um, dominant framework sort of in thinking about how complex thoughts are um, possible in the human species um, is that these are closely related to language. And the person who best articulated, I think, this view um, is Liz Spelke, um, a cognitive scientist who is now at Harvard. Um, and I, you see this on quote on the screen, I hope. Um, so her idea is that thanks to their compositional semantics, natural languages can expand the child's conceptual repertoire to include not just the pre-existing core knowledge concepts, but also any new well-formed combinations of those concepts. 
So Sperky's main work is on um, the cognition of young children, and she could show that pre-linguistically they have a lot of um, sophisticated um, conceptual knowledge, but um, but also that quite a bit of this seems to be shared with other species, um, say about physics and about uh, social relations and such things, um, and um, and to sort of explain that um, then at at some point in their infancy, uh, children become adults and become even more sophisticated in their uh, conceptual um, repertoire. Here, she thinks that language has a crucial role to, to play, and in particular the composition, compositional semantics, so this putting together um, different concepts to form more complex concepts. That was, that is her idea. And it's, a, I mean, she articulates this, but it's a very popular idea and that's closely related um, to, linguist, uh, to linguistics. And linguists have liked this, therefore. And you find kind of, um, uh, that's a, I mean, a model of grammar that is very compatible with Spelke's view. I mean, in some way, maybe inspiring to it, um, an inspiration for Spelke initially, and but then also taken up again in later work. Um, and that is the um, so-called T model of grammar, where syntax, um, syntactic structure formation, plays a central role. So you have a generator that creates a syntactic structure. The central operation of that generation is the operation merge that takes two units and forms a more complex unit out of them. Um, and then the generated structure kind of is um, accessed um, possibly with some small modifications by both a kind of thought system and the articulatory system. And so it leads to an articulation, you pronounce something and you, it sort of is read off by the thought system. But the, the complex structure formation is a central task of syntax and without syntax, um, you wouldn't have this basically. You wouldn't be able to, you, you wouldn't be able to form complex um, thoughts possibly. Um, now, in Spelke's work, she has some evidence in favor of this type of view from her work on infants, um, which I will uh, not address here in detail. But I want to address another kind of prediction that arises from this model, namely that species other than humans um, that don't have language, um, and as far as we know, they also should lack complex thoughts. And this, again, is a very, uh, like a big research area, um, like what um, uh, in animal cognition. I'm just going to look at one example um, with you. I'm gonna, just going to show you one example. And you see uh, the star of the show here. This is a crow, a New Caledonian crow, Betty, in a lab in Oxford. And um, what you're about to see is, is not um, trained behavior by the crow, but it's um, sort of a spontaneous behavior um, that she um, formed in this lab. So you see this kind of setup here. And, and I click here. So there is food hidden at the, in a little bucket at the bottom of this transparent tube. And Betty has a metal rod in her beak um, and is trying to get to the food, of course, and is poking around, but <clears throat> unable to lift the bucket. Now she had an idea and very uh, determined to see her bending the metal rod and then inserting it into the tube again without any hesitation. Um, and she is pulling up the bucket and uh, deservedly has uh, yeah, earned her food. And 
Um, at one point of this video, when she has this thought, she must, I mean, it seems to be forming the conditional thought. So if the rod was bent, I can I could pull up the bucket. And that would be a complex thought of like, uh, like a, a conditional. So, I mean, then, yeah. Um, so that at least raises a possibility um, that complex thought could be there without language. Um, it's not like maybe on the, the, this on its own, it's not definitive proof, but we, there's a possibility. And that's the one that I want to investigate. What would happen to our theory of language if we assume that complex thought structures can be formed independent of language? And there's a bit of work in linguistics that assumes this kind of model already. Um, that's, um, for example, by Bock and Lefeld and by Jackendorf that um, the thought generation is independent of language. Um, so you have the generator here, um, and then the output of that is a thought, and this all is kind of independent of language. This could still be shared with a crow. Um, and then in the Lefeld and um, um, Bock, Lefeld, and Jackendorf type of modeling, or also in um, in work in formal semantics, which is sort of my main field of interest, um, then the assumption is that there's these concepts that the thought consists of would be mapped one to one to morphemes. Um, so you have, would have go straight from the thought to an articulation. Um, and um, some, uh, yeah, I mean, and that's. Um, not the way we are going to go. Uh, so I say no here. And I, I think just also the no is already in some sense a counter example because this no communicates, it's just one morpheme, but it seems to be communicating some much more complex thought to you that um, I think that um, uh, this one to uh, one relationship between concepts and morphemes is uh, false. Um, so, and also from a kind of um, maybe engineering point of view, it would be maybe um, strange that, I mean, humans uh, communicate every part of their thoughts, even if that some of them are uh, fully um, um, redundant. So if you think about other, like um, about communication between computers or whatever, what you often find is that, I mean, you, you have an internal representation, say, of a file that is very complex, and then you use a compressing machine, like a zip algorithm or something, um, to transmit the file over email to um, somebody you're working with. Um, so the assumption that, um, um, I adopt is that there's a further step here and that we call the um, compressor um, before you then articulate the, the compressed form of the utterance. So, and you um, uh, assume, I mean, quite good about this compression. So you compress um, as much as possible. Um, so on the next page, you have a kind of caricature view of what this view then enables you uh, to do. So there might be some very complex uh, thought representation here in this uh, cloud or thought bubble, um, which um, has sort of various um, 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 uh, like a, a, a pieces that can't even be pronounced, some that may, maybe sometimes are pronounced like to to cause um, some other event or something, or do, uh, do an action. Um, but um, out of the compression, you might only get one word. Here's a word, no. Um, and that's, of course, a caricature. And I'm at this point not like uh, going to argue this in, in, in detail. But I'm going to look now at a sort of more concrete basic example um, that 
shows a little bit of this, but this is just to communicate that in principle, we should be open to a, like a relationship between um, concepts and morpheme where it's like 20 concepts to, to one morpheme or even 100 or whatever. Um, we don't know at this point. Um, so um, the one example that I want to talk about in a little more detail is um, this kind of thought representation. Um, we, um, and then present tense like linguistics. Um, here, I'm putting aside the question of whether these are really primitive, um, these, what, what's indicated by words of English here are really primitive concepts or whether these have further pieces. So probably V has actually um, at least other pieces like the first person, but also like um, like might be decomposed into a just the sort of general verbal meaning um, plus the specific aspects of like um, of the, the stem like or the, the root like. Um, Okay, and so um, assume that, I mean, my main interest here is the articulation of the present tense. And in English, there are two ways of um, articulating the present tense. Namely, you either don't articulate it at all, um, or you articulate it um, with the auxiliary do um, as sort of its own morpheme. Um, and the articulation as, as null, um, what's easy? So the silence um, is restricted to a particular environment, namely when it sort of precedes a verb. So in this case, like, if you can apply this. Um, and I mean, so this allows you to have two different articulations. So one would be V like linguistics, where you don't articulate the present tense, um, or um, we do like linguistics, where you articulate the present tense. Now I said before that, you always want to compress as much as possible. Um, so the articulation in one should be the preferred one. And that's um, what we find in um, English. Um, now, actually, though you do also, I mean, the, the two sh should be just completely ungrammatical, given what I've said so far. That's not quite right. You can also uh, say things like we do like linguistics. Um, so we have to say something more about how two is even possible. And one possible idea there might be that um, there's a, another morpheme in the, can be in the structure. So instead of the T we have, as I thought here, we have T prime, where there's a focus morpheme that applies to present tense. And then this um, environment condition for the null articulation of the present tense is not satisfied anymore. And therefore you can pronounce T prime then as we do like linguistics, because you cannot compress that any further. Okay, so that's a uh, um, simple, um, sendable concrete example of how, what this means you compress as much as possible. And it derives what is sort of called a manner implicature and it's relevant because in uh, earlier work, like about 50 years ago in linguistics, people worried about the difference between the verb kill um, and the sort of more periphrastic form cause to die or cause to become not alive or something, which um, um, also, yeah, I, I would want to possibly relate to similar underlying sort of thought structures. Um, but you see that this manner implicature restricts um, um, the, the meaning of both of them in some indirect way. And therefore equivalence is not what we expect between the two, um, between, between these two sentences that I gave you. Okay, so stepping back now to the sort of, um, uh, bigger picture again. Um, so the view that I'm um, articulating has, um, here's a generator um, and that results in a thought representation. And then there's um, the compressor that leads you to the 
articulation and for um, comprehension i mean this whole procedure is, is in some way reversed but i won't have anything to about that but um so now where does this make interesting new predictions so i'm really not i mean uh i mean i'm, I'm taking here sort of an exploratory approach in in a sense that well we, we have a seen the crow and seen some evidence that um um maybe uh, complex thought is generated independent of language or can be generated independent of language and um without being like i mean there's never a hundred percent certainty in research anyway about any conclusion so um but what what really matters is that like we we generate new predictions or new interesting areas to to explore new research questions to ask and what, what are sort of areas that kind of relate to the shift between like the T model and um, and this picture that I'm presenting here. Um, and so I we have kind of, um, I have identified four such areas. I will briefly talk about four such areas. Um, and um, the first one is that I mean, what about people who speak um, different languages, or um, how do how do different languages work? Um, uh, presumably, I mean, if the generator and the thought level are is in the crows, sort of more or less universal, um, different languages would have to be different compressors, um, and um, so different conventions about how to um uh compress these sort representations and there's i think some evidence that fits with this prediction from nominal coordination um then um they also multilingual individuals um and um particular um and and those and on this view would have to have parallel possibly parallel compressors or two compressors processes in running in parallel in their mind. Um, see, I'm, yeah, I'll summarize an example there. Um, and then the um, uh, third kind of idea um, for finding new predictions from this approach, the idea that, well, people might, uh, I mean, especially, uh, um, for, exa for example, children um, are generally people who are, are not fully neurotypical. They might either eyes over or under apply uh, compression. Um, if they over apply compression, we don't hear anything. So we don't really see so much evidence for that. But under compression um, would be very interesting because kind of the central problem of this view is to overcome the effect of compression and understand what these what could be in these thought representations because they're very um difficult to difficult to grasp if there's this compression of that basically renders a lot of them unpronounced um uh and so the idea is that sometimes uh, that we look for extra words in child language and if there's so sort of phen phenomena where, um, I mean, consistently children produce extra words in certain environments. Um, those might indicate um, that the that the thought really or the the concept there is really not a single one, maybe, but consists out of multiple units, um, and therefore we can kind of see um, something that um, at the thought level. And the final type of prediction relates to other constraints that uh, there is some evidence for that they apply at on the at the level of these sort representation. So in particular, um, something that um, I've called the uh, sort uniqueness condition, um, okay, um, which I'll briefly introduced. So this relates more to the logical properties of these thoughts and the, some evidence that these uh, um, exist, that these play, play a role in what kind of structures are possible. Okay, so um, 
the first example um, I wanted to present is one of multiple languages, um, possibly compressing structures, thought structures in different way. Um, and this um, idea about the thought structure we adopt here from, um, I adopt from work by Winter and Hasling and Schmidt, just the idea that um, and, um, I mean, is a logical connector. So if, if uh, t combines two uh, truth values generally, um, but at least in English, you can also, and in many other languages, you can also co combine two noun phrases with and, so Mary and Bill. Um, and um, and um, these people that I cite here have argued that when you combine two noun phrases, something more complex is go has to be going on because Mary and Bill are not truth values. Um, and um, I have here abbreviated in some senses more complex thing that's going on, assuming that there is a, a subset relationship kind of piece in the structure, in the thought structure, this here. Um, and then the illogical and applies. So this is then amounts to a meaning of some that you can sort of par paraphrase as there is some entity that has Mary as a part and Bill as a part, and that is happy. And that kind of corresponds to the meaning of Mary and Bill are happy. Yeah. Um, Okay, and so then the question is, how do we articulate it? Well, in Bill, yeah, you get Mary and Bill are happy, and the subset piece is not articulated. Um, but in um, in Japanese, um, um, co coordination of two nouns works differently. So you have a morphine that applies to each of the nouns, um, the mo, um, and um, and there's evidence that this mo, um, um, is, I mean, it's also used as a, gen, as a, as a quantifier. So it expresses something like, um, maybe all men are mortal, something like the subset relationship. So the all men are mortal, you can understand as all the uh, men are a subset of the mortal beings. Um, so you find the subset relationship also there in the semantics. And so, that has um, led uh, Moreno Mitrovic and my, to argue that, the, um, that this um, Mo expresses a subset relationship in Japanese, and the and part is not articulated, would not be articulated in Japanese generally. So um, you find that the two languages, I mean, uh, both use the same, I mean, have the same thought structure underlyingly, um, but the pieces that are articulated differ. Um, and so there's different compressors applying. Okay, so the next um, type of example is in, uh, then in people who uh, speak multiple languages, um, you find that they often um, switch Within, within the sentence from one language to another, if they are both spoken languages. Um, and, and that is already suggesting that there's some level of um, understanding of, of some, like the, uh, the thought level here, um, that has an independence of the particular language that they use to um, articulate these thoughts. But a more dramatic example comes from um, multimodal articulation. Um, so these are speakers of a spoken and a sign language. Usually these are um, so-called coda children, so children of deaf adults um, who then acquire the sign language from their parents and um, uh, acquire the spoken language from the environment. Um, and in one study from uh, Rankini and Donati, um, uh, no, so people have observed that these coda children, when they have a conversation with, or coda speakers, um, when they have a conversation um, amongst themselves, they frequently um, use both modalities, um, 
and to some extent simultaneously. So this is called um, code um, blending. Um, and, um, and the particular um, work here that I find interesting is that by Bagnini and Donati, um, who looked at um, speakers of Italian and then list the Italian sign language. And they found um, examples um, where um, these speakers used for Italian um, the Italian word order correctly. Um, and at the same time, so here you see the negation preceding the verb in Italian. And at the same time, they articulate also um, in list the opposite word order. So um, uh, the verb is preceding negation, as that's as a, um, at least more frequent form in list. So that suggests that um, we have something like this picture. Um, they do have, um, here's a generation of thoughts um, independent of language. And then they have these two compressors that work basically simultaneously, but independent of one another to a large extent, one leading to the oral articulation in Italian with the correct word order for Italian, and one leading to the uh, signed um, articulation um, with the correct um, word order for lists. And this seems to be restricted um, in other researchers have sort of something supported this to cases where these two sentences have that these two articulations have um, the same interpretation. Um, so it's not possible for uh, these um, Koda speakers to simultaneously articulate two different thoughts, but it always has to originate with a single thought. Okay, so the most interesting prediction from my point of view here is the um, um, the this over creativity um, of um, or under compression by um, um, speakers of a language, so in particular um, children, and th this has been investigated to some extent um, in the uh, language acquisition literature, but um, I'm not. Not in so much, uh, not with so much systematicity at this point, I think. Um, so one um, well-known example is that in English, um, um, questions sometimes children produce an extra word um, if there's an Im um, embedded sentence that the um, question relates to. So who do you think is in the box would be what the adults um, say. But the children here put the red extra who in this position. So this is work by Ross Thornton. I know. Okay. Um, another example that I'm what's mostly especially is work that I recently uh, uh, recently Kazuki Atsushi who did with me. Uh, and on, on German child language, and we found that in relative clauses, um, our children frequently repeat a whole definite description in a position in the relative clause that this sort of the relative clause relates to. So instead of um, the girl who the granddad hugs, um, they articulate who the granddad hugs the girl. Um, and um, Another class of example comes from, from more from the verbal domain. So um, things, phenomena like what uh, do you think don't you uh, don't like, um, or why could he couldn't come? Where you repeat the verb and um, further examples. Um, uh, yeah, I'm we are working on now in this project. Um, of, of finding more examples of this. I'll talk about one more now in detail because um, it's sort of emblematic. And this, um, unfortunately, um, it's illustrated here. This is from um, an example that, I mean, I, at one point of working on this project, I was kind of uh, thinking about what would be the, like the, 
perfect example. Um, and then I remembered something from my own children that they all, all I have three children and all of them did this when they um, were like, uh, um, well, when they, were, when they were quite small still. Um, my, uh, and this is a child of a colleague of mine who uh, she recorded this for me. And I think you can't hear this, but uh, I'll just give it one shot. It's just a very brief recording. So, so it's talking about the train here and says um, the train is uh, without trailer, but it puts in an extra whiz in front of the owner. So um, this, um, and this uh, is very clearly something that I think all German children probably do. Um, and in in Portuguese, um, also um, Eleni Grola told me that she knows of examples where they, Portuguese children, instead of producing just saying, produce Kong saying um, uh, to in in at some point of the development. Um, whoops, no back. Okay, so I I looked at this German um, in German in um, child corps for us. So there's a, a collection of um, transcribed um, recordings of children available for research um, in, in this Childish Consortium. Um, and I looked just at all occurrences of, of the word for without, so ohne, in German child language, and then counted how many times um, it occurs on its own. This is the orange area here. Um, and then where it occurs with a with the word mit, so the word for with, um, immediately preceding it. Um, and then also where it occurs with something else, or so negation specifically. Um, and you see that here, yeah, this is age in months, um, that between the ages of two and three, so especially around two and a half, um, like more than a quarter of the um, productions of the children. Um, of of without uh, preceded by by the word with. So this is something that older children and adults um, don't do, but it's specifically these um, two and a half year olds that exhibit this type of behavior. Um, and um, yeah, as I mentioned, I mean, uh, this, in Portuguese, this is also reported. And um, in this project, we have a um, collaboration with um, researchers on many other child languages, um, each indicated by a dot here. And um, not all of them responded to the question, but several of them remember this or have some evidence for a similar phenomenon in um, the child language they are interested in. So for example, for Dutch, you find actually parents discussing this on the internet that their children say, uh, instead of just Sonder, they say Met Sonder, which is again with and then without. Um, and in other languages, you find similar phenomena. So in, um, also in non-Indo-European languages like Tagal uh, Tagalog and um, something of the similar nature also in Karichana, which is an um, Amazonian Tupi language. And, um, and yeah, and so when there's this kind of phenomenon, not just systematically occurring within a single language, but even across um, unrelated languages, um, it should be telling us something. And here's sort of the um, proposal um, that we have. So the idea is that um, in um, German, um, owner or the, that generally this owner so without in english cannot be a primitive concept and maybe this relates to um proposals about what primitive concepts can be by gerdenforsch um, um and that means it has to be 
put together from two different pieces in, in to have a thought like um, without a trailer. Um, and these two pieces would be with and a negation. Um, and then here we have trailer. So this, and the child, when it acquires a word um, without in German, it, it kind of realizes, well, that has this meaning that the only way of generating it um, is by putting together two pieces. Um, and then it decides, well, the, the negation probably is what is articulated as owner. Um, um, but the child also learned, of course, that the with piece, when it occurs without negation, is articulated as mit. Um, and so sometimes uh, it just articulates the, the complex of with and negation as mit owner instead of what the adults do, the sort of optimal compression, is, uh, which is would be just owner. In um, English, um, children don't make this mistake. They never produce like this without. But that's because without it's actually itself is morphologically complex. And it's spelled as one word, but it really has these two pieces, with and out. And out, um, you can say is, is I mean, it's, it's a negation. It's probably something more complex than, than, than negation alone, um, but sort of. Uh, for now, let's assume that out is an articulation of the negation, um, and the with is um, this the the yeah the the other part of the this complex structure here, um, and in English, um, note so that out has many other uses. So the with in front of it is is not always recoverable um, when it. When, when the intended meaning is without, whereas owner in German really has only the meaning of without. Um, so in English, you have also um, out of the box or um, many other uses of out. Um, and that would be then the um, difference between English and German. Okay, so um, now the, um, that, that, complete sort of the discussion of the child language. Now the, um, going to um, sort the, this idea that there are further constraints that apply to thoughts. I mean, I, here yeah, I introduced first sort of a possible statement of this. So um, this goes back to work by Marie-Christine Meyer, um, who um, argued for a principle of efficiency and of, at, at, that applies kind of to when for her it was logical form representations, but we can um, say here thought representation. And that means that if um, two thought representations um, are equivalent, so they are logically mean the same, that only the less complex one is available. So at the end, um, in uh, my, uh, um, Maya's articulation, there was still this relation to the pronunciation or articulation in there. And then the work I showed that that um, um, building on Myers, that this is actually not only not needed, but uh, um, we get a better better results if we assume that that's not there. Um, I'll show one of these examples now. This, this is now rather, um, Complex and theoretical. So builds. Um, I mean, in, builds on a principle, um, like a, a, one of the um, um, one very cool and amazing observation by, by um, Fox in a influential work in 2000. So he observed that to some extent, um, syntactic operations that that affect the scope are dependent um, on whether they have a, um, they cause a difference in um, interpretation or not. So whether they, um, whether these two resulting representations are equivalent or not. Um, so in particular, you, you see this, I mean, one of Fox's examples in one. Um, um, and and it, 
um, you see here that uh, I mean uh, there is a VP ellipsis, and you have here, uh, so I read the example: a boy admires every teacher, and every girl does too. Um, the second sentence would really be if you spell out this ellipsis: every girl admires every teacher, and you have two universal quantifiers then: every girl and every teacher, and it doesn't. With two universal quantifiers, is this relative scope of these two quantifiers does not affect um, the interpretation. And Fox's idea is well, then only one representation is available, available namely where the um, subject is in the higher scope position in that, in the second conjunct. And then the first conjunct has to be interpreted in parallel to that. Um, and therefore, in the sentence in one here, a, a boy admires every teacher. The first conjunct, a boy has to take wide scope over every teacher. So it has to be a single boy doing the admiring. And that's what um, Fox observed. Um, and yeah, the second example there is a control. Now, this kind of um, is what can follow from Meyer's efficiency as well by saying, well, these. Um, for this um, structure of every girl admires every teacher, the representation where the subject has is in the wider scope position is just the more efficient one, and therefore only that one is available. Um, and um, that's what I will be assuming here, how to account for that. Um, and then observe, observe that furthermore, um, this kind of consideration explains sort of an old uh, puzzle in linguistics uh, in in uh, in question formation in English, um, namely that there is also a difference between the two question uh, in two in with respect to grammaticality. So who admires whom is totally acceptable, but in English, but who does who admire is not. And it, but in other cases, you can form questions where the object. Um, the multiple question where the object is in the first position. So namely in, in the control here, which teacher does which girl admire? Okay. And so the, um, I mean, there are many explanations out there for this, but this kind of follows from, um, um, from Meyer's principle directly. Um, if you observe that one difference between which these which phrases and the who phrases is that the who phrases don't have number marking on them. Um, and and you can answer like, um, who admires whom? Um, 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 the boys admire the girls or something. Um, and therefore, um, you can then sort of logically um, compare the meaning that is that this sentence actually has and that this sentence is predicted to have the ungrammatical sentence and can show that the two meanings are equivalent um, because of the lack of number marking whereas when there is number marking there's a difference between these two which girl so this which teacher does which girl admire versus which girl admires which teacher um, one predicts that each girl has to admire at least one teacher, and one makes a reverse prediction for this relationship between teachers and girls. But one says number marking, there's, uh, one says no number marking, then no difference is predicted in interpretation. And that then follow, from that it follows that there cannot be any thought representation that leads to, to this sentence here. Um, because that would be blocked by the, this efficiency principle, and only the one where the subject um, is first is allowed. And so here, then, this same consideration that leads to scope economy phenomena also predicts um, this uh, superiority phenomenon. It's, it's in the literature, it's known as superiority. Um, Okay, so that that was kind of the um, main areas of prediction that I wanted to point out. Um, I have sort of one add-on that concerns this idea that while well, there's this logical thought, 
representation, um, which is then leading to an articulation or sort of a, it's preempting a possible question in that domain that namely often we communicate more than just sort of logical content. Um, and um, so um, emotive content or also, I mean, by my by my accent, I co communicate maybe some social uh, status and um, such information. Um, and um, it seems that uh, I would be committed to the view that all of this is present in this in this thought representation. And I think that I mean, um, at present, it seems like as I have presented, it seems well, but we want to be open to the possibility that there is another kind of system that this social uh, mode of co uh, communication um, is part of and that in interacts to some extent with with a more logical communication system. Um, so the idea is sort of sketched here at the bottom that there's some kind of logical sentence and then there's something like a feeling that kind of in this process of compression comes in and um, can do something. So for example, in, insert a, an expressive um, and that would give you, I didn't see a damn dog, but in explain at the same time the effect that these kind of expressive um, expressives are never part of the what what the negation here applies to so I didn't see a damn dog it's still the case that I'm uh, I would be somebody who doesn't like dogs um, and um, so, yeah and then also would explain the fact that once you don't pronounce this content um, this uh, social emotive kind of meaning component disappears. So this is an example also due to POTS um, that I, if one person says, I saw a damn dog, um, another one like some dog lover then could say, no, you couldn't have, um, and not sort of own also this um, expressive part of the meaning. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so to conclude, I mean, we, we have uh, yeah, pre uh, presented, uh, I presented a novel theory of languages, meaning first of all, it's closely related to the uh, generative, um, sort of standard generative grammar with the T model, but makes slightly different predictions in some areas, and it's therefore interesting to explore. Um, and it kind of, because um, it assumes that we are really at some level directly looking at thought representations when we look at language, um, sort of um, goes back to this uh, intuition that, for example, Leibniz articulated that language are a window on the human mind, um, and maybe the best window. Um, and the central challenge, I think I made that clear in this approach of like finding out anything about the about this process of um, um, compression is to overcome and to understand really what these um, thought representations might contain, what kind of logical operations are possible there. Um, yeah, it has implications for several subfields of linguistics and yeah, uh, maybe transformational for this, our thinking about thought language relations and other things. Um, and there is a paper that came out in, in November of last year um, that contains quite a bit of this content by myself and Artemis Alexiadou. Um, it's open access in the frontiers in psychology. It does not contain at this point the acquisition um, part of this project. Okay, thank you. Thank For you, now. thank you very much, Uli. Thank you very much for the great talk. Um, people are probably uh, writing questions at YouTube. There are about 50 people following the talk right now. 
Um, I have a question while we wait for others. I was wondering about um, uh, argument structure, valency, reduction, or expansion, such as, I remember my daughter, my little daughter, when she was little, years and years ago, she would say things like, uh, my dad died the wasps. There were lots of wasps in the house. So she said, my dad died the wasps. And kids usually do this valency things. They play around with that. That Could that be understood as a valency reduction as well? I mean, not reduction, I like under compression. Uh, some languages, even like the Karaja language, they code mm -hmm. this valency in causative alternation, for example, equivalent. So there might be some sort of uh, parameterization of, uh, of compression, maybe. I don't know how. Compression would be a universal operation, but it could be, let's say, parameterized. What do you think about this idea? Um, yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the... Um, I mean, that, that compression definitely is parameterized. Yeah, that was also the um, the uh, English versus Japanese kind of example was the intent there um, to, to, to show that. And um, yeah, in argument structure um, uh, is indeed, I mean, one of the areas we centrally want to look at because um, it's, I mean, there it's very widely accepted in the sort of theoretical literature that verbs are really composed out of um, several different pieces. Um, so like you, you said, there exists tides of wasp. I mean, that, uh, uh, I mean, or cause the wasps to die or um, some more, that could be some more complex structure, and then maybe the um, some piece of the structure is not articulated in the same way as adults do, or um, something. And there, so I mean, by by, and the, the hope is so there are of course many different proposals in the theory uh, of these structures for for what actually the pieces are, and that's uh, looking at child language and in some systematic way and in many different child languages, we can narrow down how, what's a reasonable um, sort of decomposition of verbs into pieces. And yeah, that's, that's indeed uh, um, very, very central sort of to this agenda. Yeah, yeah. one of the areas so we want to look at. All right. I have another question, Uli. I was, uh, you know what happens this, this week, I was talking to some students about your talk, and some of them reported to me that they were kind of garden path, garden pathed when they read the title of your talk. So they thought, rather than interpreting it as a meaning first approach, they thought of it in terms of a meaning first approach was like a parsing chunks, you know, probably because the default uh, of first is being preposed. But of course I know because I know posing it mm. semantic, you have syntax first and you have uh, semantics first, but then he read mm. it as a meaning first approach because it was not. So you know that in the processing arena, people, mm -hmm try and measure this semantic syntactic effects, you know, and even implicit prosody or, or even explicit prosody effects. So my question is how the compression model would deal with this parsing effects in comprehension? Um, yeah, so... I mean, there's a... You probably know more about... Um, parsing than I do, but I mean, so they, um, this is, I mean, our perspective yeah, the, at this point is much more mm -hmm. it's production. based on production on and production. it's sort of this is um, yeah. the setting and you can test it yourself that, that I mean, production, production is really the bigger kind of bottleneck in communication. So when you, 
mm-hmm. listen to podcasts or, or lectures online, you can actually uh, understand quite well at 1.5 times the speed. Um, maybe I talk slowly, so maybe even double the speed would work for my speech. Um, uh, but I, I mean, but production is, uh, people can't really, I mean, unless they practice maybe a lot, they can, can't really produce speech more quickly. Um, so I, I think that that's sort of more the thing that production is more constraining for, for relevant for compression. But of course, there might be, um, Mm-hmm. Phenomena as well, and yeah, and, and and I'm I'm actually kind of interested in the question of whether, well, maybe for some groups it would also help them to put in these what extra words or some of these extra words that we think are normally mm-hmm. um, that, that are redundant for um, competent adult speakers, but maybe. Some, for some people, it might be helpful to have always consang in their input or something. Um, so there are possible predictions um, also in that domain, I think, but um, and not like the okay at okay, the forefront for us. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of food for thought, and it triggers many questions. So no doubt about that. Uh, there's a question also that I'm going to read to you from Roberta Pires de Oliver, who is a semanticist in the south of Brazil. Uh, she mm-hmm. said, "Thank you for this very inspiring talk. Why does Japanese compress less than English? The coordination example. Why maybe also when do when?" Do we or don't compress at all? Maybe related to Marcus' question. Um, I mean, first question. Yeah, I mean, why questions are always? I mean, it's <laughs> a good question. I mean, I mean, so I, I don't know whether I'm, my slides are still on for this. We first to the, we know better. First to the fact that in the Japanese example. Oh no, where were we here? I mean, I mean, you have the, the morpheme mo twice, and in English you have only one morpheme. I mean, the, most relevantly, they they just compress differently. Um, and um, question is, is now here English more efficient um, than Japanese? I mean, if you look at this one ex- example, that does seem to be the case. But it's kind of hard to say how this um, this types of like how to even do such sort of efficiency type of comparisons at the language at the level of the whole language because the morphe mo then I mean it it and so English and has another use as just clausal coordination. Um, but Japanese more can't be used as clausal coordination, but can be used as quantifier and also as so ex, to express also um, this additive particle meaning. Um, so that's efficient. And then, um, I mean, maybe, a, a, but not really a way of getting at another way of getting at this. Why question is that actually in the history, and that's uh, that's um, Moreno Mitrovic's. Um, um, work. I mean, he has, he has a whole book on these logical particles. Um, and in in the history of the Indo-European language family, actually in the early languages, you had both. Uh, well, no, you had a, like a Japanese-like system um, with, um, which then disappeared um, in most of the Indo-European languages, um, except for Sinhala in in southern India, where the Dravidian languages have more of this type of Japanese system uh, as well. Um, and in like in Latin, for example, if you speak any Latin, you still had for for expression coordination you had both et, but then also the que um, in in uh, Sinatus 
populusque um, Romanum, they have a que in there. Um, that is another way of expressing coordination, and that's more like when that can double like the Japanese one. Sometimes you can omit also one of them. Uh, so, on, so, um, so yeah, I mean, so it, it looks at first uh, like English here is more efficient, but um, and, and maybe in this historical um, trajectory, you, you can also see this, but um, um, but really both types of languages seem to be rather widespread and um, don't think that it's a, that is really like an advantage for for the English system at the, if you look at the whole language level. Okay, thank you. Um, this is still another question, Uli. Uh, actually, Leonardo Cabral is asking you to compare the compression theory with a distributed morphology. I mean, you talk about late insertion as well, and distributed mm -hmm. morphology has more room to semantics uh, as well. So, what would you have to say about that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is aptly observed. This, this proposal is close to um, to some of the thinking in distributed morphology. And um, my co-author on the paper that I mentioned at the end, um, Artemis Alexiadou, is very active or has been very active in distributed morphology. Um, and um, I mean, like in um, in a way, I mean, you can look at this as what what we manage in this kind of system because distributed morphology assumes kind of the the, the um, T or Y architecture where you have um, a generator in the syntax and then um, mm -hmm. then the split to LF and PF um, and then. Um, there is uh, one of the reasons it's called distributed morphology is that then, like this, like when you have lexical insertion, then taking place at the PF side, um, you must have some kind of simultaneous insertion of the concept at the LF side. So this is called the cat dog problem, I think, in some of this literature. Um, and going back to work by Morantz. And um, for us, that's not a problem. So we have kind of reunited in some way the morphology. So we have here, as you, you either start with cat or dog, and then you, um, as an abstract concept, I mean, that would be decomposed possibly in like the, um, the root um, and sort of some object, um, category kind of feature. And then you um, just insert here the, in the compressor as part of the compression, the morphine. Um, but the other difference is that, yeah, we, we really think that, I mean, there's always basically null articulation is under consideration in, in the compression and, um, um, Yeah, so then, I mean, so this this compression process is, I think is, is less kind of rigidly um, driven as in the distributed morphology approach. So it, we're hoping to be able to articulate this in some way that like you compress as much as is necessary um, or no, as is possible for uh, if you still so that you still have a hope that the addressee will be able to reconstruct something like your thought or, or at least do similar actions like the ones that you had intended um, from your representation. So for example, that might relate then to the fact that in, in legal documents where it's very important that people understand correctly, you can, instead of pronouns, you often use definite descriptions. Um, 
but um, in in everyday speech where precision is not so important or maybe the, the, you can reasonably assume that from context people can understand the reference of a pronoun you don't use definite descriptions as much so that this is a kind of more flexible and somewhat com context sensitive process is um, compression okay thank you Uli. thank you very much that's a great talk really a lot of food for thought triggers many issues in different areas of linguistics in the studies of acquisition architecture issues as well as even the research the psycholinguistic research and also the research with the indigenous language in Brazil that we know we are, you are also interested. So uh, we could not meet you in person earlier last year, but we hope next year you'll be able to actually come and talk yeah. to us here in person. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Look forward to that. Yes. Yes. We are looking forward to that as well. Thank you very much, Julie. That was a beautiful talk. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um.